Good morning. Everyone's fresh after coffee. I love that. Um, so thank you to Dhruv and to Dr. Slavin for asking me to be here today. It's always an honor to speak here and to see everything your team's accomplishing from year to year. Um, and thank you to Lisa and to Kathy and to Learn and Bill Rapici who have filled an incredible void for patients in the Northeast near here. So thank you for your tireless advocacy in this area. A little tiny bit about me, I've been treating for patients with lymphedema for about 20 years. I started seeing patients when I lived in London, England, and that's where I did my training. Over half of the PTs at the hospital where I worked in London were CLTs. <laughs> and then I came to Boston in 2003. Half of the PTs at MGH are not CLTs. And we're in an urban area, and I think patients in Boston still struggle to find CLTs. So when we were talking about topics for today, immediately lymphedema and quality of life came to my mind. And then I went to focus on this, this discussion and these slides, and I thought, well, this was a bad idea to stand in front of a group of people who live with lymphedema every single day as a patient, as a woman who's never suffered from lymphedema or had cancer. So I reached out to about 12 of my patients. I reached out to Kathy and to Lisa to say, I see but a glimpse of you every day when I see patients with lymphedema, but I don't know what it's like to live with it. So can you sit down and write a journal entry for me and just give me your thoughts? And they did. So I put this presentation together based on those emails and together with our patient advocate on our research team who's been with us for years and is coveted on our research team. So she helped me put these slides together and edited them quite substantially for me. So I'm hoping that I can represent this for you here today. And I just wanted to say thank you to that group. Those emails and those conversations were humbling. They were candid. And it really gave me a taste for what it's like to live with this. This is the one quote that I thought pulled it all together. With almost every decision or choice I make in life, the very first thing I consider is the impact, if any, it would have on my lymphedema. This is second nature to me now, like breathing. This was Kathy Holly, And I asked her if I could use this quote, and she said, sure. Um, and I think the ability to be so candid about this is helpful. And it does affect people every single day. And I only see them in the clinic a couple of days a week. So this was helpful. So this is what pa my patients said would help for me to talk about today. Validation that they have this and the respect that this is a serious condition that affects your quality of life substantially. Hope that what we are doing in the research area and in the clinical area is going to move this forward in the next several years. Medical professionals who know, listen, address concerns and help. That would be helpful. Understanding what may prevent or slow progression, so what control you may have. Learning how to be a self-advocate. I'm not going to touch on that much today. I think there are people here today who are far better able to talk about that than me. Um, and understanding the research. What are we doing about this? And what about trunk and breast edema? It's, it's always about arm edema after breast cancer. And I am in the breast cancer center, so I give that caveat. But there are a lot of patients here who suffer from lower extremity lymphedema. I'll try to give some stats about that. And there are a lot of patients of mine who suffer from trunk and breast edema. And this is an area where there's no research. So we're trying to change that. The great thing about lymphedema research the last five years is there have been ex an explosion of papers. And a lot of them have started to focus on this quality of life issue that patients have who are suffering with lymphedema. We know that patients have a wide range of issues. There's fear, anxiety, frustration, sadness. There are body image issues. There are functional issues, the ability to take part in activities with people you know and love. Sex, we don't talk about sex. One patient who wrote me back said, this is not sexy. There's no spontaneity anymore. And there's fatigue and limb symptoms associated with this. So we know patients are dealing with all of these symptoms and all of these quality of life issues together. And at least that's starting to be represented in the literature so we can start to do something about this. We know that patients who tell us they have lymphedema, whether or not we've measured them and diagnosed them, if they feel they have lymphedema, their quality of life is lower than people who don't feel they have lymphedema. Patients who we've measured with lymphedema and diagnosed, their quality of life is lower than patients without lymphedema. Patients with lymphedema of the leg seem to have a more impact on their quality of life than patients with lymphedema of the arm. 
And I see this in clinic, that the severity of lymphedema is not directly correlational with the impact on the quality of life. So I have patients with very little swelling and low-level lymphedema who have very severe symptoms and a major impact on their quality of life. On the other hand, I have patients who have a very swollen limb and who tell me they're almost symptom-free and it's not really bothered to their quality of life. It's really hard to know what to do with this as a clinician in terms of incorporating quality of life into our screening and our treatment. The things patients identify in research papers in the last few years, that healthcare workers' knowledge and awareness is low, I think we all agree on that. They have limited access to care. It's hard to obtain compression. I'm at MGH and I have patients who have a tough time getting co the compression right to fit their life. Um, there's decreased attention to psychosocial consequences in the emotional side of lymphedema. And we are starting to see a lot more papers come out about the, fi the financial cost of having lymphedema. There was one article out of Australia by Dr. Boyages, who's at the University, uh, Macquarie University, and he found that patients with lymphedema on average spend about $1,000 a year. Now that's in a country that has a lot of coverage for lymphedema, and I know here that's but one compression garment for some people. And on Medicare, there's no, there's no coverage for these. So we are currently putting together a manuscript about cost as well because we need insurance companies to listen and we need to start justifying a screening program and better support for compression. There's hope in the research. We know that patients feel strengthened when they have the support they need, when they're getting educated, and this is good education from knowledgeable providers. When they have those two things together, they can develop a more helpful view of lymphedema and how to help themselves negotiate through this. There's hope because we continue to see the incidence of lymphedema decreasing. On the left of this screen, we have how breast cancer treatment in terms of lymph node surgery and radiation has um, improved over time. And on the right, how lymphedema rates have dropped. We used, to, we talked a little bit about auxiliary node dissection this morning. We used to clear the nodes pretty much in the axilla. We used to do cobalt radiation, which was brutal treatment. The lymphedema rates in the upper extremity were 60 to 70 percent, and they were much higher in the lower extremity. When we decreased the number of nodes removed with node dissection and we added photon radiation, the lymphedema rates halved. And now, we talked a little bit about this this morning too, in the advent of sentinel node biopsy only, when there's only one or two positive nodes on a sentinel node biopsy, we no longer dissect the lymph nodes. We choose to radiate the lymph nodes. And that decision, based on a couple of large studies, large randomized control trials, that too has halved the in lymphedema incidence. If we don't have to radiate the lymph nodes, the incidence of lymphedema in our cohort at MGH is only about 5% at two years. So we are getting there and we are improving treatments, but we still see patients who have that axillary lymph node dissection and regional lymph node radiation. So this is a bar chart that we give to our patients as part of our breast cancer related lymphedema education. And we tell them what their risk is based on the patients we have at MGH. So on the right with the red circle for patients who have node dissection and regional lymph node radiation, their two year incidence is about 24%. So I will tell patients, you are in our high risk group but if I had four of you in front of me, three of you are not getting lymphedema. So we want you to be vigilant and we want you to know what to look for and tell us early if you feel any of it, but we want you to live your life too. And those who had sentinel lymph node biopsy only, I will tell them we really want you to live your life. If you develop lymphedema, your risk is not zero, but it's low. I have seen patients after sentinel node biopsy only develop lymphedema. They would be one of the unlucky few. So I want these patients to live their lives but still know what to look for and know that their risk is low. There's a lot of hope with lymphatic surgery and drug trials for lymphedema. I see how Dhruv and his team here at the BI have changed the lives of many of my patients who I continue to email him at late hours with and he so graciously sees them and uh, his team does amazing things. So I think there's a lot of hope there. And <clears throat> drug trials. Is there a pill for lymphedema? Is there something that can help prevent progression or prevent it altogether? I think there's a lot more to come in that area as well. We're seeing papers come out about lymphatic surgery and quality of life and something Dr. Singhal touched on this morning. But we're seeing that patients are having better quality of life after lymphatic surgery. It's not all about just measuring limb volume. They feel better. 
And that's a huge difference. And, and I know from my patients seeing him that he's very honest with patients about what he can achieve with the therapy for each patient. And I think that's a huge quality of life impact. So what about breast edema? I see patients who suffer with this. It's very symptomatic. The incidence is very high. So for patients who have lumpectomy for breast cancer treatment, up to 90% of them develop breast edema at some point, and it's very bothersome. You can see from the chart, sorry, this slide's a little bit busy, but you can see from the graph there that most patients, the upper line, don't develop breast edema after lumpectomy. But you have this subset of them, about 30% of them, actually 40% of them, who develop breast edema certainly within the first year and a half, two years after lumpectomy. And it's persistent and it's stubborn, and we don't know how to treat it. There's very little research on this, so we're hoping to change that. I tend to throw everything at breast edema. I tend to do, do skin care and education. I have these patients exercise. I think it has a huge role. We talked about this this morning as well. Um, I do a lot of manual techniques, manual lymph drainage, scar techniques, myofascial techniques, kinesio taping, compression, swell spots, all of it together, some of it, um, but we really don't know well what works and we need more work here. So we educate our patients as part of our lymphedema screening program that they can get breast edema. This can turn into breast lymphedema. We tell them what to look for. We ask them to come to us, and I'm, I'm getting more and more referrals for patients with breast lymphedema, and I think it's really helpful for them to get treatment because it really helps with their symptoms and their quality of life. The first question I often get when I have a new referral, when I see a patient for the first time with lymphedema, is what could I have done? that would have avoided this? And my answer is your risk factors for lymphedema were pretty much set in stone the day you were diagnosed with cancer and the day we did your surgery. There's nothing you could have done to prevent this. And I think that's huge from a quality of life standpoint. The things we can control is that when a patient has a little bit of swelling or a little bit of symptoms, we know they're at risk for progression and it's then that I want to see them and consider their risk factors and consider whether or not we treat really early. I invite all of my patients to exercise. That's a huge component of what we do. And we know from some very good studies that if done properly and supervised and mindfully progressed, exercise is a very good thing. And skin care, I, I wanted to change the slide, but I didn't get to it. We would all avoid infection if given the chance. So I, I don't tell patients to avoid infection. I tell patients that if you get a cut or a, a bee sting or a burn in your oven, which you will, just make sure it's healing well. And if it's not healing well, or if you notice any signs or symptoms of infection, get to your physician right away because we don't want you to have cellulitis. And if you have it, we want to treat it early so that you don't swell. We know that the risk factors for lymphedema, the main ones, are, the main one is surgery. It's dissection of the lymph nodes. And the second one is radiation of the lymph nodes, not just breast radiation, but radiation of the lymph nodes. The other is body mass index at time of diagnosis. Again, not something you can change. It's, it's set in stone the day you're diagnosed. How to be your own advocate. Again, I think there are people here today who are better able to talk to this, but this is some of the things my patients said, that it starts at diagnosis, even when your mind is on other things, to know what to look for and demand that from your team, that you know what to look for with lymphedema and know when to reach out. There are more and more resources. The LEARN website is, is a great source of information for patients. Teach anyone who will listen, was one thing one of my patients said. Talk to your family, your healthcare providers, your friends. If you help one person know what this is and see it in advance, that's helpful. I think having your CLT but checking in regularly is a great thing. I had a patient recently come back to me. I haven't seen her in three years. A lot has changed. We were better able to find some compression for her that fit her life much better, and she's compliant with it now because it fits into her life and it's comfortable. She just wasn't comfortable in it and nor was it feasible for her. So I would encourage people to check in every year or two, which is what I tell my patients now minimum, to see what's new because there's a lot coming out. People need a champion to help them get through this. That was a quote from one of my patients. There are a lot of good publications. I love the 10 things lymphedema, what I want my physician to know, what I want my family to know. I think those are great publications. I tend to give those to patients. Conferences, there, I was at the International Lymphedema Framework Conference in June in Chicago, and a patient stood up 
and had a very different view from what was presented by the presenter that day. And I thought it was really helpful. So, um, you know, anytime you can get in front of these people at conferences and make your voice heard, I think that's really important. Medical professionals need to be, as Dr. Singal said this morning, pushing guidelines, helping to get things covered with insurance. If they're not there, if the people who know about lymphedema are not on these boards, things will not change. So what are we doing about it? I can certainly talk to what we're doing at MGH about this in the breast center. And Kathy's been instrumental in starting to educate outside of the breast center, which is so important. And we just don't have the bandwidth for that yet. But hopefully in the future. So we have a multidisciplinary team, as Dr. Singal said this morning, it's priceless. It takes a village to get this done. And our patient advocate, as I said earlier, is coveted. We pass every paper by her, every presentation, and she always has a different perspective and a patient perspective, which none of us share. So that's important. Screening, we want screening to be standard of care for every single patient diagnosed for cancer, and we're not even there yet at MGH, but we are trying to make it standard of care within the breast center and with more hospital support. We're trying to get screening covered. We are working together with MGH administration to request a CDT code for lymphedema screening so that there can be coverage for a lymphedema screening program across the country. And we're going to be reaching out to other facilities as well to help us with that. We educate patients, providers, anyone who will listen. We try to get to as many conferences as we can. And research and publications, we are including symptoms and quality of life in every project we do. We presented nine different projects at the International Conference in Chicago, and there were quality of life and symptoms data in every single one, because I think it's a piece that we miss. The other thing I wanted to mention is early intervention. If we can screen, which we are, and we want everyone to do, and it's a, a recommendation by many societies, but still not happening, if we can screen and we can catch this early and we can treat it, can we prevent progression of lymphedema so that we no longer see these limbs in stage two and three lymphedema? And the other thing is cost. We are currently putting together a manuscript about the cost of lymphedema in terms that insurance companies will understand to prove the incredible difference that we have found between, in cost, between a screening program and an impairment-based program where people come to us with severe symptoms and signs of lymphedema. It costs much less to screen and treat early, so we want insurance, insurance providers to continue to hear about that. So I think there's so much more to come. There's lots of literature coming. I would say make your voice heard because we as providers don't understand that quality of life piece and you can help us with that. One of my patients ended her email. This is a woman who's suffering with lymphedema and is quite ill and trying to manage all the other life things she has going on. And she finished her email with, what can we do to help? Count me in. And 78% of our patients are part of our clinical trials. So that's, that will help us get the work forward. So thank you for your time.